Right, what I'm going to be talking about very, very briefly in the session now is looking at social media from the point of view of somebody who spent most of the last 15 years of their life working in privacy and data protection and related areas. And it does give you that sort of mildly dystopian view, this idea that somehow, somewhere, the data that you're putting out there is possibly at some point by somebody going to be used by in ways that you didn't intend, you don't want, you don't like. Um, and it's interesting, of course, because we see ourselves, we promote ourselves, we put ourselves out there in different ways, at different times, uh, in different environments. So, for quite a lot of the time during my working week, I'm, I'm Andrew and I'm a lawyer. It begins to sound a little uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I apologise for that, but I'm Andrew, I'm a lawyer, and we spend a lot of time trying to work out what privacy actually is, and unfortunately for most of us, working out what privacy is, is a little bit like the judge trying to, uh, to explain what obscenity meant, and the judge said, well, I don't really know exactly, I can't define what obscenity means, but I know it when I see it, and you have the same kind of thing with privacy. We don't, we would find it very difficult to say, well, what is private to us? What is the, our private sphere? What is it that makes our privacy? But we know it when it's gone. We know it when we think somebody's breached it. And it's interesting when you look at the history of privacy and law, how recent a concept it is. The first real discussion of this was the turn of the 20th century, 1890. Warren and Brandeis write an article because uh, Warren is annoyed that the yellow press, the media, have made a bit of a story out of his daughter's wedding. And we then really have a break, a hiatus in that discussion until the 1960s when people start to talk about the, um, the archive society, the dossier society. We're still in the paper sphere. We now talk, of course, about the database society. So how much of a modern invention is our current individualistic concept of privacy? And we also sometimes forget that privacy has a dark side. The ability for us to say, stay out of my private sphere, stay out of the family home, stay out of the house, out of my living space, can conceal things that we would rather didn't go on. Child abuse, for instance, wife beating. It happens in the family home, it's outside the governance of the state. So there are all kinds of issues surrounding privacy rights and what we think are acceptable privacy rights and what are unacceptable privacy rights. A postgraduate student of mine is doing a study on privacy at the moment. It's taken her 18 months to work out exactly what, how she's going to define privacy. And she's going to be looking at that in the, in the context of the UK and China. Because in the UK we have a very Western individualistic view of privacy. In China, it's more communitarian. What is private to you depends on what is good for society. So there are these issues of individual rights and community objectives. There are community objectives that may justify invading our privacy. And here are some examples. And you'll note at the bottom, probably one of the key ones with regard to um, social media, the free market economy. What can we use all that lovely, lovely data that's milling around in the social uh, media environment? Oh yeah, I'm Andrew, I'm a lawyer, I'm also, I'm Andy, and an academic. I teach in the University of the Hill. Why do we want privacy? Quite often what we want from privacy when we want from privacy changes with the context. What we say on Facebook is different from what we might want to expose to our employer, employer or to our mother, for instance. And that desire for privacy is not black and white. It's shades of grey. It's not I want privacy or I don't want privacy. It's in certain contexts, I would like this information to be restricted to certain people. The problem we have is that both the law and, as we'll see with Facebook settings, tends very much to either be black and white, you have privacy, or you don't have privacy, or it is absurdly complex and granular. So Facebook has 50 different buttons you can press to uh, set your privacy settings, 170 different potential privacy settings. 
The law, for instance, differentiates between ordinary personal data and sensitive personal data. Sensitive personal data includes medical records. If I tell you I'm off sick tomorrow, have I given you personal data that needs special protection? Difficult to say. Another me. I'm Chip, and I'm an ACDC fan, I'm clearly from the photograph of Fashion Victim. <laughs> Is privacy the right to, let, to be let alone? I think it's more contract, con, um, complex than that. Is it about controlling access to yourself? Well, David Beckham would like to control access to himself. Mick Jagger would like. Where does that boundary lie? What's wrong with being open? David Brin, the science fiction writer, wrote quite a, a good book called The Transparent Society, saying, well, actually, it would be fairer on everybody if everything was open. Why did Mark Zuckerberg refer to all those people that put information on Facebook as dumb fucks? Why did people give you this information? Well, I don't know, it's a bunch of dumb fucks. <laughs> Another me. I'm Hun to my wife. Uh, and I'm married, and still you'll know fashionably attired. <laughs> I'm a bit of a schizophrenic when it comes to being an academic, because on the one hand I'll come to events like this and I'll tell you, all privacy, important. Data that goes into social media is sticky. It could be out there forever. You don't know how it's going to be used. That might be a bad thing. It might be a risk. And yet when I'm working for the British Library in archiving and legal issues of digital archiving, we're now saying, oh, we need to be able to access your digital material because we need to cr create a history of the way that digital media will use. So we want your data and we want it to stick around and we want to use it. There's a contradiction. I'm you and I'm a face in the crowd. Maybe I'd like to stay a face in the crowd. Maybe I don't want exposure. If you've got nothing to hide, have you got nothing to fear? I get this all the time as people say, well, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. Do younger generations not care about privacy? You hear that a lot. Why do we hear that a lot? Why does the media say, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, the young people don't care about privacy? Well, who's behind MySpace, Facebook, Friends Reunited, Twitter? Well, Rupert Murdoch owns MySpace. You may or may not be aware of that. Microsoft had a share in Facebook. The comic company E.C. Thompson and Friends Reunited, and Jeff Bezos of Amazon owns part of Twitter. So for every situation is a me. And I'm hoping what the photographs have got, have got through to. I'm a different person in different contexts. Are all those me's commodities? Should they be bought and sold? Can they be bought and sold? Should I be able to control those contexts? And if I should, if we think I should, how am I going to do that? Does the law do it for me? Does technology do it for me? And how is my information likely to be used? And I'm, I'm looking at a group of experts here. How might my information be used in the future? I don't know. Maybe you guys can 